Britain's easy money addiction killed off manufacturing. Luckily, Britain had a good social safety net. There was free NHS hospital treatment for its citizens, social housing, and housing benefit. There were unemployment benefits and reasonable access to higher education. Many of the actors, artists, comedians, and musicians we know and love and still see all over the place today have at one time or another gotten support from Britain's social safety net. It could probably be said that there was a symbiotic relationship between the City of London and Britain's creative community. The wealth from the city enabled a reasonable social security system, which was fair enough because after all, it was the addiction that killed manufacturing and jobs. The unexpected byproduct of this symbiotic relationship was a boost to Britain's reputation as global leaders in pop music and youth culture. People talk about a universal basic income today. Britain's social security system was almost like a basic income. And this paid off in unexpected ways. Britain has a global reputation as a hip and vibrant center. This isn't the highbrow, stuffy and state art of the aristocrats in their galleries and their institutions. This is the art of the commoners! When it comes to GDP, Britain's creative sector held its own with the financial sector, creating just as much money. In 2014, five of the ten best-selling albums globally were by British artists. According to an academic article from 2015, the two best periods for British pop music were in the 1960s and the 1980s. And the Beatles are still selling records 50 years after Sgt. Pepper's. British pop music history even upstaged the Queen at the 2012 Olympics. The myth of people being unproductive under a universal basic income has been smashed by the British. For even if just one artist becomes successful out of many, that one has the potential to create whole industries around themselves. And often they continue to generate GDP long after their careers are over. The British invasion grew from the streets and took over the world. But are the latest government policies killing the golden goose? The addiction to easy money from the city made Britain vulnerable. With most of her eggs in one basket, her financial sector became too big to fail. Then when the financial crisis hit in 2008, the government had to do something to save the financial sector. The Bank of England created a program called quantitative easing. <laughs> quantitative easing is where the banks just print up lots of money out of thin air and then they spend it on assets and other mystical financial instruments. This is supposed to stimulate the economy, but instead it only stimulates the pockets of those that already have money. <laughs> This money never made its way down to the people or to small business. Instead, most of it was invested in assets, further inflating the housing market. Between 2009 and 2012, the Bank of England created 435 billion pounds. In order to compensate for all the money they printed, the government decided to impose a strict austerity on its poorest and most vulnerable citizens. There was a bedroom tax, narrowing disability definitions, and a sell-off of council homes. On top of that, the citizens found themselves having to compete with people from all over Europe for whatever remaining jobs were left. Not only were their complaints ignored, but they were called names yeah. simply for complaining. Racist. When the British public voted to join the European community in 1975, it was supposed to be just a common market. Little did they know that the EU had more lofty ambitions. The EU began to morph into a federal super state. Each year, the dues for staying in got higher and higher. The EU imposed an open door policy where anybody in Europe could work in the UK. This was wonderful for the big corporations who flooded into Britain to take advantage of the low wages. Soon every high street began to look the same as the multinationals crowded out the local shops. The financial crisis left UK citizens with fewer jobs, lower wages, sky-high rents, and a dwindling safety net. This has brought about a drastic change in Britain's eclectic and homegrown art scene. So say hello to... 
globalist art. This is where the corporation and the state replace the artist. Young people, having suffered the worst financially, can no longer afford to take risks. They work longer hours and have less free time. Few can afford to go to university anymore with tuition fees only affordable for the wealthiest. Gone are the days when young artists could take control, form their own bands, write their own songs, design their own clothes and wear them. This is being replaced by shows like X Factor and Pop Idol. These shows are like boot camps for young globalist artists. Another word is trained seals. This is where we have the artist demoted. The judges have replaced the artist with themselves. Nowadays, they upstage the contestant. It is they that decide what songs the artist sings, how they sing it, what they wear, even how they behave. <gasps> These trained seals I, I mean, artists all vie for the judge's attention, wagging their little tails, eager to be molded. The other rather uninspiring avenues are the arts councils and government grants. But instead of snooty judges, we've got snooty bureaucrats instead. Oh, oh, oh. Artists have to apply to these councils, pretending to be vacuous and pompous in their language. Eh, uh, I wish to explore the textural capacity of form, which underlies the re-emergence of cultural duplicity inherent in patriarchal normative foundations of primitive cultures. My feces-stained canvas here sheds light on the futility of postmodern existence. Oh, oh, oh. Death of the artist? Birth of the trained seal. Oh, oh, oh. What can Britain do? Well, let me tell you. Come back next week to learn all the solutions to Britain's addiction, which you'll hear all about in the last and final episode. Please like this video, tell all your mates, and subscribe to the channel.